Uh, last time we finished talking about applications of uh, homology. Right, so we did the Jordan closed curve theorem. We proved invariance of domain. And we did the left shots fixed point theorem. OK, questions on what we did last time? OK, so. So that's what we want to do with homology. Um, next semester, uh, we'll talk about something called cohomology, which is like homology, but, um, but it's a little better in that you have a multiplication. So whereas uh, the homology groups form abelian groups. Um, and if you were to put them all together, you just have a bigger abelian group. Uh, the um, cohomology groups, when you put them all together, you get a ring. So you can multiply cohomology classes and get cohomology classes of higher degree in a, in a very useful way. Um, and it turns out that all of that structure is homotopy invariant. So the ring structure on cohomology is a homotopy invariant. And so you can use it um, much the way we used cohomology, uh, but you have more tools. Uh, yes? Sorry, um, I think maybe someone asked this last time, but I don't remember the answer. Uh -huh. If cohomology is like does everything that homology does, but it's better, then why didn't we just do that? Instead? Right. Uh, well, you, you, um, you use the tools you developed to get homology to get cohomology. And, um, and I was going to say it's not strictly better, but it is strictly better. <laughs> Uh, well, but sometimes homology is like the right tool to use, uh, and sometimes cohomology. So they're dual to each other. And so sometimes one point of view is better than another point of view, even if they end up being rather equivalent. Yeah. Um, yes, but so the way um, 526 starts is you, you use all of the things we've done about chain complexes and whatever to define cohomology very quickly. And then you just start seeing the, the, the new properties that you have from it. And the other thing uh, that's in 526 is the higher homotopy groups, which we have defined briefly. So this is uh, like pi 1 is uh, looking at maps, homotopy classes of maps from the circle into your space. Then um, higher homotopy groups are look at homotopy classes of maps from Sn into your space for arbitrary n. And uh, so you, you get groups. Just like homology, you get an, an infinite sequence of groups. And um, uh, just like homology, but uh, in contrast to the fundamental group, they are abelian after the first one. They're all abelian. And, um, and also in contrast to homology, if you have a manifold of dimension n, the homotopy groups don't stop at the nth. But you have homotopy groups that are detecting some higher dimensional holes that you don't know where they are. So uh, the, um, the typical phrase is that uh, homotopy is easy to define, but impossible to compute. And homology is hard to define, but easy to compute. Uh, great. So what I want to talk about today is what, um, what can you do beyond homology? <coughs> or like, what do you do if homology fails? Right? So I want to tell you what happens in one example. Um, so lens spaces. Uh, lens spaces were introduced by uh, Tietze in uh, 1908. This was very early in the story of topology. And the idea was to have some spaces where you could actually compute things so that you could test out your invariants to see how good they were. Right? So um, you have two co-prime integers. And you get this from the three sphere by modding out by a, a ZM action. So the way to think about this is that um, think of the three sphere as being pairs of complex numbers whose moduli add up to 1. And then what we're going to do is we're going to mod out by um, 
C1, C2 are going to be identified with uh, what you get by multiplying, multiplying the first one by an mth root of unity, primitive nth root of unity, and then multiplying the second one by the nth power of that same root. Right? So this is a free action. So what you get is a manifold. Um, we can think about it uh, like this. Let's say that um, let's say that we write each of these in polar coordinates. So we have uh, two pi i theta one, and then r two to two pi i theta two. So we want the the r's to add up, and we're going to identify uh, let's say theta one theta two with theta 1 plus uh, 1 over m and theta 2 plus n over m. Yes? Remember here you wrote s3 minus zm? Yes. Does the n come into play somewhere? Uh, yes, it's the mth root of unity. Right? So, uh, so as you see, here I'm adding 1 over m. So I have to do this m times to get back where I started. Okay. Right? And this guy, well, this is doing something different, but it's still going to, because they're relatively prime, I have to add m times before I end up back where I started. Right? So, uh, so this is the action. So if you like, let's let um, i if rho, um, rho from s3 to s3 is given by um, c1, c2 goes to theta m c1. Mm -hmm say to m to the mc2, then uh, uh, we have an action of cm on s3, where the, um, uh, the, the kth element here uh, acts by uh, rho to the k on sm, s3. Okay, so this is the, the action of Zm, and if you mod out by that action, what you're doing is you're identifying all points with anything on their, in their orbit. Yes? So why, I guess maybe this is going on Emily's question, maybe I don't understand the answer. So why would this be different than, like, why, why couldn't this, why would this be different with any other number besides n that's also co-prime to m? That's an excellent question. So um, that is sort of uh, the, the point of what we're going to study, because it turns out the homology doesn't notice n at all. Um, we notice n because you, you get the orbits are different. Right? So, um, so what you're doing, you can think that you have uh, these two coordinates. Right? And in one coordinate, you're rotating by uh, 1 over m. And the other coordinate, you're rotating by some multiple of that. Right? And it turns out you get different spaces depending on what n is. Um, you don't always get different spaces. Um, here, let me tell you what, what the answer is. So it turns out that uh, L M N is homotopy equivalent to L M prime N prime if and only if M has to be the same as M prime and um, N prime has to be congruent to plus or minus N uh, inverse, actually plus or minus 1, times K squared, this mod M for some K in the naturals. Right, so up to homotopy, um, n doesn't entirely matter. What matters is um, n up to this equivalence relation. On the other hand, um, L m n is homeomorphic If and only if, well, it has to be homotopy equivalent. So this has to be satisfied. But we have something stronger for homeomorphism. You have to have m equal to m prime and <coughs> n prime congruent to plus or minus n to plus or minus 1 mod m. 
Right, so you take k equal to 1. Okay, so, so just a second. So what, um, what difference does n make? Right, well, two n's will give you the same space, homeomorphism, um, if they satisfy this property. Right? And if they don't, then you get dif different spaces. Right? So, so even though you are modding out by, by the action of CM, you have different actions of CM. Right? And those different actions give you different spaces. Yes? So is LMN defined as such an example of a lens space? Or is this what a general lens space is, like S3 mod? A three-dimensional lens space is LMN for some M and N co-prime. Okay. Yeah. There are lens spaces in higher dimensions. Yes? So I guess my question is notationally, if we see S3 on up as the M, how do we know what N was? Because Right. So that's a very good question. This is sloppy notation, although it's always used. Uh, so yeah, because, because indeed, there are many different actions of CM many different free actions of CM on S3, and this doesn't tell you which one it is. So yeah, so this is sloppy notation. This is what we actually are studying. Okay. Yeah, so it's this action of, of CM. So did we get your questions? Yes, that answered my question. OK. <laughs> OK, excellent. So, so that's the punchline, uh, homotopy equivalence. Um, happens for those values of m and n, uh, and n prime, n prime, whereas homeomorphism happens for the other ones. Um, and of course, homology and the fundamental group, all the things we've been studying this semester, are homotopy invariant. Right? So there are lots of examples where you have homotopy equivalent spaces that are not homeomorphic. <coughs> right? So L71 and L72 you can check, uh, satisfy the condition to be homotopy equivalent, but don't satisfy the condition to be homeomorphic. Right? So um, this was conjectured uh, very quickly after these spaces were introduced, uh, but it took a long time for people to be able to prove it. Um, so I think it was Hurevich who conjectured early on that if you had a, a manifold without boundary, then uh, homotopy equivalence of two manifolds without boundary um, only happened if you had a homeomorphism between them. Right? So this was known as Horevich's problem. And um, incidentally, um, Vitold Horevich um, had a, a very unfortunate death. He was famously absent-minded and distracted. And there was a conference in, uh, in Mexico where they went to visit the cigarettes, the Mayan cigarettes, and he fell off. Um, there's, a, there's a beautiful volume, uh, a conference uh, proceedings uh, from them, so it became a memorial volume to Hurevich. So the 1956 um, Conference of Topology is a wonderful volume, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, so uh, Hurevich's problem was uh, whether or not homotopy equivalent in uh, closed manifolds implied uh, that they were homeomorphic. And lens spaces were the first counterexample, the first uh, ones where they found they weren't. Um, OK, so let's quickly compute the, um, the invariance that we've been studying, the fundamental group and the um, homology. Yes? Yes, Joseph, um, on our homework a few weeks ago, yes. I think there was a lens space, and it was like a bunch of different like tetrahedra <clears throat> yes. kind of attached. How, like, which lens space would that be? Uh, it was probably all of them. So all of okay. these that's are, what like? that's what they look like. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think the one we had was n equals 6, n equals 1. Okay. Because it was arbitrary, wasn't it? Yeah. I think it was, you're right, I think it was n equals uh, arbitrary, but n equals okay. 1. And the drawing had n equals 6. Okay. Yeah. Because each tetrahedron, the top and bottom, were connected to the next one around. Right, so that's, exactly. That's n equals 1, presumably. Right. n equals 2 would be like you skip over every other Exactly. One. Yeah. Good. Well, I'm glad it was on the homework. <laughs> 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 yeah, 
<laughs> What's not to love? <laughs> uh, yeah, so Tiza came up with this because it was like the simplest class of examples in three dimensions where you could actually compute things. Um, so, um, so let's compute things. So the fundamental group is easy because uh, this is a, uh, a covering map, a covering group action, whatever it was we called them, covering action of a group. So um, the, the quotient map, S3 to LMN, is uh, the universal cover. So the fundamental group is Zn. OK, now to compute the homology, um, well, Sorry. yes. This is a long time ago, maybe yes. I, like, this is a few weeks ago. Uh -huh. Why is this implied? Or... Right, so, um, OK, so we have a, a, um, a covering action. So this is a cover, yeah. and this is simply connected. Right. So it is the universal cover. Sure. And um, once you have the universal cover, then you know that the deck transformations are isomorphic to the fundamental group, okay. right? But the deck transformations are precisely the, the, the group action we're modding out by, okay. right? So the group we're modding out by is isomorphic to the fundamental right. group. Thank you. Sure. OK, so let's find a, um, a fundamental domain for this action. So let's say E3, well, so. What you probably did on the homework is you studied these guys. So these are going to be three cells. Uh, I'm putting a tilde because it's going to be on S3. And I'm going to have one for each k in C mod m. Right? And so all this is going to be in this notation is look at the places where um, theta, or theta is between k over m and k plus 1 over m, theta 1. Right, so the action um, rotates the first coordinate by 1 over m. Right? So, so just take one fundamental domain for that. OK? Then the two cells are going to be the boundaries of these. So take where theta 1 is equal to k over m. Now, each of these, if you fix theta 1, then, um, then what's left is theta 2. Right? And theta 2 is moving in a circle. And so what you want is um, uh, e tilde uh, 1 k is going to be, um, let's say, theta 1 is fixed at 0. And you're going to have theta uh, 2 going between k over m and k plus 1 over m. And then vertices, so theta tilde 0, is going to be theta 1 is fixed at 0, and theta 2 is k over m. OK. So given my drawing abilities, Drawing a picture might confuse things. So first, let's stare at this, and then I'll try a picture. OK, so, um, so this should make a lot of sense, because you have um, the action is just rotating in the first coordinate by 1 over m. right? So what you should look at, if you were thinking of just looking at the circle and you're rotating by 1 over m, or you're yeah, rotating by 1 over m, um, then, um, then you should just look at an interval of length 1 over m. Right? And then if once you've decided that this is your three cell, then your two cell is just the boundary. Right? So each of these is going to be uh, a disk. Uh, and so that disk has boundary a circle. So you should look at that circle, and then you want to uh, break it up into cells that respect the group action. So you should also break that up into uh, intervals of 1 over m. Right? And then your vertices are the endpoints of those intervals. Right? 
Um, OK. So let's try a picture. Um, yes? So before you, you draw the picture, so when you comment on how many cells we have in each dimension, it's like Yeah, so here, k, in all of these, k runs over c mod m. So we have m of them, yeah. But, um, but they're all identified. So maybe I should start by saying what happens. So rho sends um, e tilde 3k to e tilde 3k plus 1. And it does the same thing uh, to the two cells. It sends um, e um, tilde 1k. It sends this to e tilde 1k plus n. And it does the same thing to the um, zero cells. Right? That's because the group action is uh, just rotate by 1 over m in the first coordinate and rotate by n over m in the, um, in the other coordinate. Right? So since we're defining these using the second coordinate, uh, this is what happens. Right? So rho just permutes, permutes these cells. So when we take the quotient, Taking the quotient, when you take the quotient, you identify two points if you can get from one to the other using rho or any power of rho. Right? So that means that everybody in this cell gets identified with somebody in this cell. Right? And, and same thing for all of, the, uh, all of the dimensions. So all of the different three cells get identified when you take the quotient. All of the different two cells get identified when you take the quotient. All of the different one cells get identified, and all of the different zero cells get identified. So mm -hmm. taking the quotient, we get a cell complex structure. Uh, E0, E1, E2, E3. All right, a single cell in each degree, each dimension. Right? So this should remind you of a uh, um, projective uh, plane, right? well, RP3 in this case. Uh, so RP3 is an example. It would be L21. OK, so let me try to draw something. Um, OK, so first problem in drawing, well, first problem is drawing with me. Second problem in drawing is uh, that uh, it's happening in S3, and S3 we'd like to think of as living in R4, and we can't draw that much, right? So the way out, out from that is um, a stereographic projection, or rather, so you can think of S3 as being R3 union appointed infinity, right? So let's think of R3 as being S3 minus appointed infinity, and draw everything in R3. So we're going to replace um, S3, so minus uh, a point is uh, R3. So what's this look like in R3? Well, there's a circle, and there's a circle. Right? So this is Z1. Um, let's say this is C1. Uh, this C1 is varying. So let's say C2 equal to 0, oh, and this can be C1 equal to 0. Right? So this is a circle because it goes through the point at infinity. Right? That's where it closes up. Um, so if we were to have uh, mod C1 equal to a constant, that would look like you thicken this up to a torus. So let's put that over there. Let me instead draw a torus. OK, so this is the torus, right? So that is correct, yes. Thank you. 
but also the modulus of C1 equal to a constant. Yes, because the sum of the moduli squared adds up to 1. So you have these tori. OK. Uh, now, what does this cell complex look like? So let's look at, let's go back to the circles. So Z1 is uh, happening over here. So what you have here are the uh, mth roots of unity. And um, so those are the mth roots of unity. And then um, you also have those on this line. But of course, this line is the circle really stretched out. So you might have something like. Uh, things close together here and then far apart. <coughs> and, and then what you're doing is um, you're connecting. So you're going to have um, little cells, I don't know, something like this, little wedges like that. These are going to be some of the cells, and this is going to break up into lots of these little cells. I assume this was the picture that you were studying on the homework, something like this, with little cells coming from attaching these. Um, there you go. Yeah, so the picture on the homework, that, uh, that's the picture I'm trying to draw, basically. Uh, <laughs> yes? So when we did the homework, we had n different cells in the resulting space. And here you're saying there's only one three cell? There is only one three cell if these are the three cells you started with on the sphere. You could do, so there are, just like for the projective plane, there are many different descriptions. There are many different descriptions of lens spaces. Um, this is start with S3 and mod out by CM. You could also start with the three-dimensional disk and then do identifications on the boundary, just like you can with the projective plane. You start with the disk and do identifications only on the boundary. You could also, um, so see this, this picture, what really, what this picture tells us is that the S3 is a union of two tori by identifying their boundaries, the two filled-in tori. Because here's a filled in torus, and the complement is also a filled in torus. It's just it has a point at infinity. So, um, so you can also construct lens spaces by taking uh, two filled in tori and identifying their boundaries um, using a curve of um, slope uh, n over m. I guess here's my question. Um, there is one three-dimensional cell in LMN. In this cell complex def in description, cell yes. Complex structure, yes. Yes. What shape is E3? That is to say, what type of polyhedron is it? Well, it's this, right? It's uh, in, in uh, look at all of the points in here, where the first angle is between um, uh, one over k over m and k plus one over m. OK, and we don't care about what the second angle is. Right, so we're not imposing anything on the second angle. So in this picture, those aren't the cells we're drawing? Uh, no, I'm drawing um, more like two-dimensional things. Three-dimensional things would involve the entire uh, line. OK. Yeah. Um, yes. Anyway, that's, that's my attempt at a picture. Uh, really, go with the, the uh, description, the analytic description. That's better. Um, set theoretic. OK, but in any case, what we want to know is what is the homology? Right? So, so we just need to think about what happens when you take a boundary. So let's say you take the boundary of um, the three cell uh, corresponding to 0. Uh, well, the boundary are going to be when theta 1 is equal to 1 over m and when theta 1 is equal to 0 over m, right, directly from the description. And so that's equal to e uh, to 1 minus e to 0, which we can think of as rho minus the identity applied to e tilde to 0.
right? So that should be clear from the set theoretic description, right? So it's just theta 1 is going from 0 to 1, so you're taking the boundary at 0 and 1, right? Then what happens when you take the boundary of the corresponding 2-cell? OK, well, each 2-cell is a disk. It's being attached on a circle, right? The circle we broke up into these 1 over m pieces, these e tilde 1. So you're going to get all of those. So you're going to get e tilde 1, 0 plus e tilde 1, 1 e tilde 1, m minus 1, which we can write as uh, identity plus rho plus rho squared plus, so you get the rho m minus 1, uh, e tilde 1, 0. Right? So it's, this is a segment of size 1 over m. Every time I hit it with a rho, I rotate it, I rotate it by n over m. But that's OK. I rotate it. I permute them. And if I take this, all of the sum, I get all of the segments. So I get the whole circle. And if I take the boundary of um, a segment, uh, then I'm going to get, um, well, the segment, um, uh, let's go with L, uh, 0, the vertex E0, L, and the vertex E0, 0, where L has the property that L times n is congruent to 1 mod m. Right? So since n and m are relatively prime, I can find an L such that L times n is congruent to 1. Right? So, and I know that um, rho is, uh, well, I don't, uh, rho is rotating them uh, by uh, n over m. So I need the lth one to get whatever one was next. Right, whatever one corresponds to rotating by 1. So I can write this as rho to the L minus identity e tilde 0, 0. Right, now, of course, this is all happening on S3. And we write it like this in terms of rho because uh, when we pass to the quotient, On L, M, N, uh, rho is the identity. Right? Rho doesn't do anything. So we end up with a boundary of E, E3 um, is identity minus identity, 0. Boundary of E2 is identity plus identity plus identity, so M times E1. Boundary of E1 is identity minus identity, 0. So our complex is Z, C. So this is the, the CW chain complex. Uh, where the first map is 0, the next map is multiplication by m, the next map is 0. So the homology of L, M, N is going to be, OK, well, on top degree, I'm going to take the kernel mod out by the image. So I'm going to get Z if uh, K is equal to uh, 3. Then the next case, I'm going to take the kernel of this map. Well, that's an injective map. So that's going to be 0. So 0 if K is equal to 2. Uh, the next one, I'm going to take the kernel of this map. Well, that's everything. Mod out by the image of this map. But that's the multiples of m. So I'm going to get c mod m, k is equal to 1. And then in degree 0, I'm going to get z. And then, of course, it's 0 otherwise. OK. So again, only M showed up, right? N did not show up at all. So we note 
that I1 and H only depend on M. And we've noticed that whether or not you have homotopy equivalent or homeomorphic spaces depends on M and N. So we want some, some way of noticing the N topologically. Right? So what Rademeister noted, uh, he noticed that what, what you really want is to take into account how the fundamental group acts on the universal cover. Because right? the fundamental group is C mod M. But we saw that, um, well, but we know that everything comes down to this row acting on S3. And the row is just the action of the fundamental group by deck transformations. Right? So right master noticed that we need to take into account the action of pi 1 on the universal cover. And he defined a gadget to do that, which is called Rademeister torsion. Okay, So uh, most generally, this is a, an invariant for based chain complexes well, not most generally. Most generally for today's class. Uh, an invariant for based chain complexes of um, free, um, free groups. Well, free modules, but let's go with groups. Uh, free groups, free rings, um, with, um, without homology. OK, so, so let's step back. We'll come back to how you define this for, for a lens space. And it's just what if you have a chain complex and it ha has no homology, right? So the homology theory doesn't help you at all, right? You want to extract some information from it. So um, let's, let's think about the simplest thing that could happen. So if we have an, a chain complex without homology, so of course, a chain complex without homology is what we call an exact complex. A chain complex, i.e., an exact complex. Um, let's see, of length one would be something like this, right? And since it's exact, this is an isomorphism, right? So the question is, what invariant can you assign to a chain complex um, where you just have an isomorphism? Well, this is, we're saying free rings. So let's say that this is just some power of z. And this is also some power of z. Same power, because they're isomorphic. Right? If we choose these isomorphisms, if we have a basis, let's say little c1 of capital C1 and little c2 of capital C2, then this isomorphism is multiplication by a matrix, by an invertible matrix. Uh, so let's give this a name. Um, let's call this um, alpha. Then um, if we have a basis, then alpha is represented by an invertible matrix. And we define uh, delta, which depends on these little, well, let's say, the complex and the bases. 
and it's just going to be the determinant of alpha. Okay? So if you have bases, then your invariant is the determinant. Okay? And so that's, that's going to be the Rademeister torsion of a complex, the simplest exact complex. Um, OK, what if you have a more general, uh, a larger complex? Um, for a larger complex, <coughs> um, well, here are two ways, um, uh, two approaches. The first one, um, so let's say you have Cn maps to Cn minus 1, minus 2. Right, and we're going to have, let's call them boundary maps. Uh, and we have, uh, and we are given bases little ci of capital ci. OK. So these guys, this is exact, but, but these are not isomorphisms. Right? So these spaces don't have to have the same dimension. So if I were to look at associated matrices, there's no reason for them to be square, and I can't take a determinant. However, one thing you can do is uh, we can pick auxiliary bases <clears throat> so um, b sub i um, b sub i for um, um, well let's say b sub i union b i minus 1 tilde, where b i is a basis for the, um, the image, for image of boundary i plus 1, and b i minus 1 tilde when you hit it with boundary, is equal to bi minus 1. Right. So I know that I can sp each of these is exact. So I know that the, the image of one is the kernel of the next one. So what I can do is um, get a basis where I take um, a basis for the image of one and then a preimage for the basis of the next one. For the image, yeah. So uh, these together will give us a basis of each ci. And then what we do is we um, denote by uh, bi union bi minus 1 tilde this bracket where we put one basis and then a, a line and then another basis. Um, the determinant of the change of basis mm -hmm. matrix. Okay. Yes. Yes. Oh, what do you mean by free free? Um, well, if you like, just take free abelian. So just take a power of said. Uh, wonderful. So this is how we get, we bring in determinants. We just look at the change of basis matrices. Right? Of course, we've had to introduce these auxiliary bases. Um, but then we define the torsion to be the alternating product 
of these guys. So it's going to be the product i goes from 0 to n of um, b i union b i minus 1 tilde, I should see i, and then raised to minus 1 to the i. Right. So just like the Euler characteristic was an alternating sum, the um, torsion, the randomizer torsion, is an alternating product of determinants. What is the exponent? Minus 1 to the i. Okay, so you might think that in the notation I left out the bi's. So, yes? Um, why? So, so, so the auxiliary basis. Oh, are we saying here that each of the, this is, so our first part is bi. Yes. And then the second part of the basis is b tilde i minus 1. Are we saying that those are somehow like, lifts of the things from i minus 1. That's right. So they're just things okay. that satisfy this property. Ah, OK. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, what happens if you, um, uh -huh. if you change, if you use a different uh, auxiliary um, bases, uh, if you use different auxiliary bases, then uh, say b i um, b i minus one tilde prime, then um, you would get so delta c dot would become uh, the product of b i um, prime b i. Uh, B i uh, minus one tilde b i minus one uh, prime tilde times the um, this guy with uh, uh, I think the okay I'm just going to put uh, primes here. And I may need to put inverses there. OK, so what happens is you get the same thing you had before, um, but you have to multiply by the change of bases matrices for these bases that you've changed. Right? Uh, however, they appear with alternating signs. right? And they appear twice. Each one appears twice. It appears with when you're doing i and when you're doing i minus 1. Right, and uh, so they cancel out, and um, so these guys cancel out. Uh, except for the first and last one, uh, those don't appear twice. However, no, mm, oh, can't quite remember what happens to those, but they don't matter. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'll think about it. But the result is that uh, the auxiliary bases don't matter. They, all of the dependence on them cancels out. Yes? So it says at the start that we are given bases, and then we could pick our auxiliary bases. Do the initial bases we pick matter? Yes. OK. And here it just says they are given. Um, That's right. So at the moment, we're, we're defining this only for, for based chain complexes. So you have to have a basis to start with. OK. And someone else that's right. Yeah. So um, you can keep track of, of um, the dependence on that basis. And it's just a matter of where, where you think of this as living. Um, OK. So that's one, th that's one approach. And um, maybe I won't flesh out the other approach. Let me just tell you, because it is kind of cool. Um, it turns out that every exact complex is um, chain homotopic to a, uh, a, a complex of length 
1. Right? So there is always um, a, um, um, yeah, so there exists gamma from C i to C i plus 1 such that um, boundary gamma plus gamma boundary is equal to the identity. I'm going to write it as the identity minus 0. So uh, remember, this is what a chain homotopy is. It's something where um, it's, it's a map gamma that uh, a map of chain, well, it doesn't commute with D. It, instead, when you, when you pre and post compose with D and add, you get the difference of two things. Right? So this is what we used to prove that homotopic maps induce the same map in homology, because this obviously induces the zero map in homology. Um, and so this says the identity and the zero map give you the same map in homology. Right? So anytime you have no homology, actually the identity is chain homotopic to the zero map. Right? But um, that means that you can look at, say, the boundary map plus gamma as a map going from, well, let's write it like this, 0, and put all of the even ones together, uh, and then all of the odd ones together, and 0, and consider boundary plus gamma mapping between them. This is an isomorphism. Okay, So you can define the Radermeister torsion of the original complex to be just the determinant of this map. Once you, the bases you've get, you are given give you a basis for the some of the even ones and a basis for the sum of the odd ones. And so we've reduced back to the, the simplest case. And you just take the determinant of that map. Okay. So this is really easy to prove. You just write it down one at a time. Right? At every step, you know enough to write down the next gamma. Um, but in the interest of time, there's one approach. OK, so what does this have to do with the space? Right, that's for a complex. Oh, I didn't want to erase that. <laughs> so much so, I'm going to put it back. It's equal to rho minus identity to zero. So for a cell complex, <clears throat> so let's say we have cell complex x. Let's say finite. And let's say we're given a representation of uh, pi 1 of x in, um, in a commutative ring. Well, do I care? I don't want, I don't need it to be commutative uh, in a ring uh, A. Right. Our application will be the complex number. So if we need commutative, we'll just assume commutative. OK, here's what you do. Um, first, um, so we have our x is written as a union of, um, of cells, e, k, j. So um, k goes from 0 to n, say. Um, so you have these cells in this union over j. Right? So this is the cell complex structure on x. And what we do is we lift it to, um, to a cell complex structure on, um, on x tilde, g in the fundamental group. OK, so once you lift, you pick one lift of each of these cells 
then all of the other lifts of that particular cell are obtained by a deck transformation, or related by a deck transformation. Right? So it's enough to pick one lift of each one, and then just multiply by every element in the group. And that will give you cells for x tilde. Right? So the only choice was, how do you lift each one of them? Right? But for one such choice, then you get a cell complex structure up here. Okay. I'm sorry? Why do you need the union offset? Oh, so uh, the cells of dimension k, there are a bunch of them. I mean, you know, why do you need the union Oh, you still need a union of j because the, these are different. So, um, yeah, I mean, you could think that you have, um, you know, two circles sitting inside your space, and the group might just be rotating each circle individually. And so I need to have um, you know, a, a cell over here and a cell over here. There's no reason why the group would take one circle to another. OK, so we have this cell complex structure up here. And this is an equivariant cell complex structure. This is equivariant. in that uh, I can multiply by a, an element of the group and permute the cells. Right. If you multiply um, by an element of the group, well, you'll just multi hit this g, hit it with g prime, and the cells just get moved around. Right? So the groups in the corresponding uh, CW complex of x tilde have uh, g action, pi 1 of x action. Okay. Now, this ring also has a pi 1 of x action, right? because it has, I have a representation. Right? Let's give the representation a name. Let's call this beta, because I used alpha earlier. Um, so what we can do is form a cell complex, CK of x um, beta, to be what you get by looking at the uh, equivariant um, cells on x tilde and then tensor that um, with uh, this ring using the representation beta, right? So this tensor product is, is um, you'd want to say pi 1, because it's the pi 1 action that we're modding out by. Pi 1 acting here should be the same as moving that pi 1 packed over here. But um, mm. you, know, you tensor over a ring, so really it's the group ring. So the free abelian group on the group. Pi 1. OK. So because the, the boundary map um, acts on these cells, right? it lifts to an equivariant map up here, and so it descends to a map here. Right? So um, the boundary map, uh, we haven't induced. We have. And it forms a complex. OK, and it has a preferred basis uh, with a preferred Preferred has one F or two Fs? One. Thank you. OK. Uh, with a preferred basis. The preferred basis is precisely the, um, the, the lifts of the EKJ, so lifts. Well, tensored with 
the identity in A. Assume the ring has an identity. Right? So the cell complex structure, assume that that's fixed, then, um, then you have these lifts. OK, there's a choice in the lift. But other than that, we have a preferred basis. Uh, so we can define the um, so define the Radermeister torsion of X with respect to the um, representation beta to be precisely the uh, the torsion of this complex. If if this is if this has no homology, right? If this complex has no homology, okay. So <clears throat> this it turns out um, this is. Um, well-defined element of the units in A mod out by, so we have some ambiguity because we had to choose a lift. Um, so that ambiguity uh, gives you uh, plus or minus an element uh, beta of pi 1 of x. So this just ambiguity. From, um, from choice of lift. Right. So as you were asking, um, it does depend on the basis we started with. Right? So, so that's why we don't end up with just an element here. You end up with some ambiguity. But modulo that ambiguity, you have a well-defined invariant. OK, wonderful. So. Um, this, this invariant is not homotopy invariant. But it is homeomorphism invariant. It actually took a long time. So this was introduced in 1935. Uh, it took until the 60s uh, to get a proof that it was a homo homeomorphism invariant for manifolds, and until the 70s to show that it was a homeomorphism invariant for arbitrary cell complexes. Um, what Rademeister was able to show was that it is an invariant under subdivision. So if you have a, a cell complex structure and you obtain another cell complex structure by subdividing, then, um, then the Radermeister torsion doesn't change. Right? So uh, if you have um, a smooth manifold, lens spaces are smooth manifolds, then any two um, triangulations have a common subdivision. So, so that was enough to, to know that it was a, a diffeomorphism invariant of, uh, of smooth manifolds. Um, but in fact, it's a homeomorphism invariant. OK, but importantly, it's not a homotopy invariant. So that's why it is stronger than homology and uh, the homotopy groups. Right? So it can distinguish more. So what do we do for lens spaces? So for lens spaces, it's yes? So uh, I wrote down, uh, they are homotopy equivalent if and only if m is equal to m prime. And n prime is congruent to plus or minus k squared n to plus or minus 1, where k is a natural number. That congruence is mod m. Right? So we have, we have explicit conditions on when they are homotopy equivalent and when they are homeomorphic and they're different. Um, so for lens spaces, well, uh, the, the, the reason we started with lens spaces and described everything on S3 is that, of course, we've already done 
uh, all of this uh, lifting and so on. We started out with a, um, a cell decomposition upstairs that was equivariant with respect to the group action. So we've already done this. So what we have left to do is to pick a representation. So for lens spaces, um, let um, um, beta k, well, or let's do it like this. Let omega be an mth root of unity. And let beta sub omega uh, be the representation. So this is going to be uh, CM to um, um, a one dimensional representation. So I'm just going to be multiplying by a complex number. And what I want is to take uh, the, um, the generator to omega. Right? So since it is an mth root of unity, um, this is uh, a representation. Right? It's a group homomorphism. Right? So think of these as invertible one by one matrices. So it's a, it's a one dimensional group representation. Okay? So, so what this has to do is to look at the cell complex that you get by looking at the cells upstairs, tensoring with your ring, and then modding out by the action of the group. Right? So look at the cells upstairs, right? tensor with the ring, so tensor with the complex numbers, mod out by the action of the group. So all we're going to do is we're going to replace this row with omega. Right? So in uh, this x, Beta omega tensor let's see, let's see pi one. We have um, delta of e three tilde um, zero tensored with uh, one identity um, is equal to. Uh, so everywhere I had a row, I put an omega. Zero tensor identity. Um, two, zero. Is equal to one plus omega plus omega squared. Omega to the L minus one e to the zero zero tensor the identity. So our complex looks like um, plus uh, star omega minus one, and then this sum, which is zero. OK, so notice that this sum, right? since you can write it as omega to the m minus 1 divided by omega minus 1, then as long as omega is not 1, this is just 0. So the torsion is um, of um, L space, L, M, and with respect to beta omega, as long as omega is not 1, is equal to um, omega to the L minus 1 times omega minus 1. Right. Um, I should say that these are isomorphisms. 
Right, I really should say that first. So these are isomorphisms. Hence, this complex has no homology. So it makes sense to take the torsion. And the torsion is this uh, as an element of C plus up to a plus or minus a power of uh, omega. Well, k wherever you want. Right. So the ambiguity in choices comes uh, down to uh, just a power of omega. OK, so, so now it's just a matter of staring at this. And when do you get the same element of this quotient group? Um, what does that tell you about L? Right? So obviously, if I were to pull out um, a power of, of um, omega to the L, uh, I would get 1 minus omega to the minus L uh, times omega to the minus 1. And I don't care about the power of, uh, of omega. And I don't care about the sign either. Um, so I can, I can put a minus sign there and make this omega to the minus L minus 1. Right? So I don't care about the sine of L. And um, if I want to take omega inverse, what I can do is I can pull out an omega from there to get 1 minus omega inverse. And I can pull out an omega to the L from there. And that's um, 1 minus omega to the minus L. No, to the, yes, to the minus L. Uh, I'm sorry? Didn't you already pull out the omega? Uh, right, so I can do that over here, but um, right. So let's say, indeed, let's say that we're here already. We pull out that omega, and we have this omega to the minus L minus 1. I can, of course, pull out a minus sign to make this omega inverse to the minus 1. So that replaces omega with omega inverse. Right, so I replace omega with omega inverse. Um, that still only gave me minus L. What did I want to end up with? Um, plus or minus L or L inverse. Um, OK, well, that's how you change L. And I'm just going to say fact. <laughs> uh, this, uh, uh, two of these are equal. If and only if uh, L is congruent to plus or minus uh, L prime to plus or minus 1 mod M. OK, so the minus was easy. And I don't remember how to get the, the L to the minus 1. But anyway, you just play around with it. OK, so, um, so that's Rademeister torsion. And it is, uh, it's a stronger invariant in that sense. Um, if for lens spaces, it is a complete invariant. So uh, two lens spaces are homeomorphic if and only if they have the same pi 1 and the same uh, Rademeister torsion. Right? Um, Yes. Anyway, I'll stop there. That is our course. Have a good summer. Thank you. Mm -hmm.